cultural sensitivity is the is the utopia that one would aim for doing multicultural management in addition but not in place is specific or country specific cultural management uh, we were having a discussion a little while ago and since the 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 event is india france let me uh, say that countries next door to each other can be vastly different and nobody here needs to be told examples of that in addition there are countries like india in mention has been made uh, in the research project that i worked uh, in for about 15 years we had 62 countries and there were countries who claimed they were extremely diverse just because they had people of two shades of skin but when they were told that there were 14 languages which are written on indian currency notes you can all check your currency notes from india if you like and thousands of dialects all kinds of religions so that project was called globe global leadership and organizational effectiveness g l o b e organizational behavior effectiveness uh finally some of the people who were non indian also agreed in that project that india needs a globe cultural project of its own we don't understand each other's languages we are very suspicious of each other's uh, religions we have problems of ethnicity so the point i am making indirectly is that indians are multicultural by not only birth but by nature so i think there is an intuitive understanding of multiculturalism in india which very often does not come to the surface because there are friends who say tell me how to understand india 10 points to understand india i have spent 68 years here and i don't understand it fully so india is a wonderful laboratory for multiculturalism which has all its problems that multiculturalism provides but it has a learning opportunity and i think some of us are doing not too bad a job of it uh, <clears throat> i will stop here and open the floor to any questions comments observations and since there was a comment made there is no woman on the dais let me begin with the lady in front hi uh, my name is anika i am an architect designer i work at the bank with the company so i work in a business environment i would like to provoke the entire panel when they say that multiculturalism cannot be taught I come from a design background and I have some colleagues here and uh, I protest. Multiculturalism is taught not consciously but it is inherent part of any design pedagogy anywhere in the world. And one of the simple things that is uh, taught is empathy, sensitivity as you said, which automatically brings to the whole idea is putting yourself in another person's shoes and it comes it's not about bending or presenting the card in a particular way. So that is by uh, provocation to the entire panel, but more specifically to Professor Sahai, um, you said that multiculturalism is a deliberate effort. So I mean, kind of taking on to that, I don't think it's deliberate at all. If you are ingrained in your sort of pedagogic process to take up the science of it as it is done at the NIT, right next door to our home, the bar. And uh, my second comment is to uh, Mr. Manam uh, when he was talking about water 24/7. The question is, why do we need? Why do we need water 24/7? <laughs> Not because I don't trust you, but because it is wasteful. Yes, I mean we can have a conversation <laughs> on it. But from a design perspective, in India, we've always been used to storing water. Now it would be a systems exercise on how you can have. Water stored without being on the tap 24/7, and I would say that why not extend that usage internationally? I mean, I think a lot of water is wasted the world over because it's on tap all the time. And the second question is when you talk about developing a network of technicians in India, Mr. Manan, mm -hmm. have you looked at the phenomena in India that all plumbers in India are from Orissa? And why is that so? <laughs> It's a question that would uh, be interesting to delve upon, and maybe there is an opportunity there of training culturally that group of artisans, craftsmen, technicians, whatever you want to call them. And it is all about India expanding. Uh, would you like to respond? Yes, yeah, sure. 
And second was that uh, that it requires a deliberate effort. Um, so on the first part, uh, you know, building on uh, Jadeep's point about multiculturalism being to some extent innate in India. Um, so at the last count, there was supposed to be 25% of the Indian population was supposed to be internal migrants, uh, where you are living in a different region of the country and you probably picked up a second language or a third language. Uh, and you're doing that not deliberately, you're doing that as a part of everyday life. Um, so the diamond worker in Surat who is from Bihar or from uh, from other part of the country knows Gujarati and has been staying there for the last 15 years and has picked up some local modes and all that. And nobody has taught it to him. It's, it's, it's become ingrained into him to some extent. Right? Uh, and to a large extent, for a large proportion of the population, my proposition to you, my submission to you is uh, that what happens is that this happens unconscious. It is not deliberate. Right? So that's one one side of the equation. The other side is that uh, now, given all of the diversity that's in, there in India, one can still have some. There are still some common assumptions of behavior which bind a lot of Indians would be my claim. Now we can contest that. But there are still some common assumptions of interpersonal behavior. Yes. Uh, those common assumptions of interpersonal behavior do not translate, especially in a Western context. You take that diamond worker out of Surat and put him in the States or in Europe. Uh, those assumptions of interpersonal behavior, which are largely common, largely, some very basic assumptions, not the nuances, not the applications, uh, then suddenly, uh, the first response of the individual is, uh, you know, there is shock. There is, uh, okay, you know, from personal example, I think I speak English fairly well. Uh, I land up in Texas and I find nobody understands me because I have a very different accent and I speak very fast. Uh, and I use words very differently. So uh, what happens is then it requires deliberate effort on the part to modify. It doesn't come automatically on the spot. Unlike the person who spent 15 years, I don't have 15 years, I have to make that adjustment within a week, 10 days, 2 months uh, if I want to be effective as a PhD student uh, or as a teacher in uh, a university abroad. And therefore that requires deliberate adjustment, um, conscious effort. Uh, if one had the time, yes, absolutely, uh, it could happen. And that uh, deliberate effort adds to the sensitivity, the empathy that one is talking about. It makes the process a little bit faster. So I was coming at it from that angle. That's all. Dr. Menem? Yes, uh, it's interesting because what you said, everybody said that when we... Uh, uh, it's very easy to answer this question. It's, it's, there's three reasons, main reason why every country should have water 24 7 with their distribution system. The first issue is a health issue, okay? When you don't have water all the time in your pipe, what happens is you, you create a depression of your pipe. And all the, the waste which is outside the pipe go inside the pipe. This is where you have very, very dirty water and is where people are sick. So it's, it's a major, it's, it's a basic issue is all the pipe in the distribution system should be full all the time. Okay, first thing. Second one is by doing what we're doing now, that means two times a week, two times a day, you send, you send water like this, okay, water hammer, we say. You break your pipe, and your pipe will have a, 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 time, a lifetime of half of what it should be. So economically, it's very important. Third one is the habit of the people. You know what most of the people do? They have a reservoir, and just before they know the water will come, they empty their reservoir to get fresh water. So in terms of wastage, you are wasting much more water with your reservoir than without reservoir. <coughs> in Europe, where we have around four or five bars of pressure is where the consumption of water is the lowest. We have around 110 liters per inhabitant per day in Europe. Okay? Here, in most of the places where you have not way for seven, you can have 200, 300, 400 liters per day. So the fact that you can have 24 seven doesn't mean that you will consume more water. But it will give a good water, safe, and it will assure a long time to your network. Okay. And in response to the first part of your question, the panel stands totally provoked. Yes, ma'am.
Understand French culture. In one sentence. And since he wanted to say something. <laughs> no, no, I want to say something. I will. No, no, go ahead. I'll hold off on this. <laughs> I'll let my colleague start. So, the question was can you give one example of uh, what we understand by French culture? Is that the question? Uh, well, I'll give an example. It's uh, more the Indian part. As you said, it's, for instance, uh, the multiplicity of Indian culture. I'm not sure I understand your question. Yes. <laughs> Maybe I can help because the first thing about this, my, my name is Savant Etc. Uh, I work for PSA Davis as well. I'm the head of UX Innovation Department. And I'm running uh, multicultural and uh, multidisciplinary teams. And uh, yesterday we were at this uh, design conclave and we were talking about multicultural issues. Multicultural issues. Oh, my voice. And uh, we were um, discussing about how can we finish this design conclave, maybe working together Indian and, and, and French people, uh, uh, trying to, to build a dictionary uh, of different concepts that are French concepts, whether uh, Indian concepts. But the purpose is not to build the dictionary, in fact. The purpose is to be together and to live together and to share different paradigm and different behaviors in order to find out at the end uh, a way to deliver uh, a, a common, uh, common work. This could be an example. I've done it with my teams. When we arrived, there were engineers, ergonomists, developers, and believe me, when there is a designer that is talking with an ergonomist, sometimes it's like when a French people is talking to Japanese people. So we first tried to build this lexical uh, nuances approach uh, and it was, we, 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 we have done this book, you can buy it, no? And that the book is not the important issue. The important issue is to be together, try uh, in a very intensive and, uh, and uh, uh, emerge way to understand each other. No, I think the question is, you see, this is one example. We are trying to understand the question. <laughs> the, the question to me appears to be how would an Indian characterize French culture in one sentence? Yes. One, word. one word. word. This is asking for too much. French. Yeah. Yeah, let, us, let us try one sentence to begin with. Yes, Ajit. La weekend. <laughs> yeah. I know they use yeah. the word, la, la weekend. So, uh, Blackberry has been around for a long time. So, therefore, in India, if you send somebody a message, you can, you, if you don't get it for 10 minutes, you, well, why are you not replying? Mm. But if it's La weekend in France, uh, until recently, now after 2008, things are changing. But you, if it's a weekend, don't expect an answer until Monday morning. <laughs> Even if you it's over Germany or something. Mm. Even if you get on the weekday, you are looking at it. Yeah, yeah. Just to be uh, counter-provocative. Uh, we, we used to start our program with a, a game which was based on a, a true story. One of my colleagues was uh, head of the Human Resource Management Department of uh, UTA, which was a very famous French airline. And uh, UTA merged with uh, Swiss Air. So they were having some multicultural uh, problems. Uh, at that time, my colleague told me that there was, uh, I think, something like almost 90 different nationalities in the top management. So the CEO of Swiss decided to improve the homogeneity of uh, the top management. And he invited a professor of business, I won't tell his name for charity, uh, to design a program. Uh, to help this uh, project. So what he designed is uh, he created several tables with a mix of all the culture around the table and each table was targeting 
to define what is an Indian, what is an Italian, what is a German, what is a Spanish, and blah, blah, blah. And it's very funny because very soon some pressure was put on all the table. Very soon people started to play, saying, Italian love women, Italian are loving so soccer, they are twitching, they are simulating, they are loving their mother, they are... And at the end of this first stage, one of each table, one representative of each table was supposed to go on the uh, show and say, okay, what is the definition? The problem is that my, my colleague was in love with an Italian. And she was uh, afraid that was what was saying about Italian in this table. So she moved to the uh, front sh show and she started to say, I think we have forget one nationality and one uh, type. What is a Jew? And the 150 people started to stay quite silent. And, and the CEO realized that if you are going into this direction, then you are going to stereotypes. And then some stereotypes are less dangerous than the others. But when you are touching to one, for the Westerners, it's very touchy, you know. And he canceled everything. So my colleague wasn't paid and uh, started to be really upset by this long lady who raised the wrong question at the wrong time. But you see what is interesting, that you've got a lot of implicit in culture. And even ourselves, we are not able to design our own culture. And I used to quote something very interesting. The, Fr the US Army, before uh, uh, D-Day, uh, gave some small books to the uh, US uh, soldiers uh, to help them to be more friend friendly with the French. And it was very interesting from the French point of view because if you are reading, French women are very open-minded. They are very happy to be kissed. French people are not very good with soaps and they don't uh, like showers. They are smell, they are, and if you are French reading this on your own culture, you say, oh, this is impossible. So do the job with your own culture, and you will see, you will go very fast toward stereotype. So I won't play you again. <laughs> I think, in fact, let me um, pick up on exactly where I think, actually, this is a perfect example of multiculturalism. I think you are coming from a particular discipline, a particular way. For somebody like me, I cannot, I don't, I can, cannot represent complexity in one sentence. So for me, I, from, from your point of view, it is possible that there's a way of representing something that's complex in a simple manner, but for somebody like me, so I mean, I think disciplines in that sense are mm -hmm. also cultures, right? So I, I think um, in some sense it's a perfect example of how uh, people coming from different cultures may perceive the world different. or be able to describe the world or think they can describe the world differently, whereas some of us where academics of a particular kind actually feel very uncomfortable doing that because mm. our culture refuses to allow us to do that. <laughs> right? This is, you know, the, I think nobody in this room is below 20. Please raise your hand if you're below 20. Uh, see, this is the 140 character generation. Half of yeah. India is below 25. So I agree with her, actually. We, we take it as a challenge, you know. Can you represent what a complex thought in one yeah. sentence or half a mm. sentence? But why? So anyway, by, we... By the way, the love weekend, I think the Englishmen and the Dutch people will behave differently. Just to be... No, but let me, let me also remind ourselves that the lady also said the panelists should give their answers very briefly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. That's what she said, yeah. Maybe that was the intention. Uh, uh, Chairman, sir, <laughs> I don't have a question if I can indulge in my observations. Uh, you know, in, in the same way and if they are not too long. <laughs> no, no, I just wanted to just add to what you said and Dr. Anadi said. You know, I mean, uh, I agree. I mean, this has been a uh, subject of interest because I spent about uh, four or five years in Italy and in four years in the US trying to facilitate business and have come across this problem and there are certain things I want to say. Uh, you were right, you know, I was remembering an uh, uh, interview by, uh, with uh, Mr. Carl Gosen when you know, Iraq took over uh, Nissan, you know, the success story, he said that the most critical region of a success is 
that we managed our cross-cultural differences well. Like you said, it cannot be taught, it must be understood and it must be managed, or cannot, aligning the cross-cultural differences. And Dr. Amade talked about the language, culture and all. I just want to share some examples. Uh, actually, it happened with a, a French company. I was in Italy. A Fiat, that is subsidiary Maniti Marriage out of France. So we're doing a program and this guy says, look, we both speak English, but I do not understand him. You know, and many companies in America said that when in South Indians, whether they say yes or no, like they nod their head and all. Mm -hmm. So I told them, look at the ear. If the ear moves up and down, this is <laughs> The nose moves left and right, this is no. So this is universal. America will say yes. But other thing, you know, coming to language, the way they say it, uh, I came across a particular situation when I knew an Indian businessman, being a very honest and fair person. His partner says, this is a dangerous person. I said, why? He said, look, we have a joint venture. And, you know, every time I ask him, is there a problem? He says, no problem. But I went, we did the audit and all, there are a lot of problems. So I went deep into it. It was found that there are certain problems, some notices, some delays in approval, some kind of notices from them. So I told, and that is what I understood. You see, particularly in the North Indian Agency, he says, when there is a no problem, means there is a problem, we do not worry and manage it. That kind of thing, not, no problem. So you don't take it, no problem, he's hiding something from you. So these are the things, you know, I think, you know, what uh, you said, people have to swim or sink and depends on how rigid or flexible you are. So. Uh, that is like uh, Mr. Amar said, you know, culture cannot be, you know, uh, in the business context, it has to be understood and, you know, that is what I just wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody here had raised their hand. Yeah. I think that person is Oh. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. He's had a hand up Hi. Uh, my name is Anish Bhattak. I am a researcher at Indra in Paris. Uh, being an Indian who studied in the U.S. and now lives in Paris with an American wife, I think this is an amazing place for me to have come. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and for telling us that it's impossible to solve this easily. Uh, but what I wanted to ask the panel about is something I think Dr. Ranade recently just mentioned. It's about the culture of age. Uh, now, being in technology myself, and I try to explain, oh, you should use your smartphone to solve this problem. It's very nice. They're like, I don't want a phone. And this, and it's not even age-based, but it is, to some extent, correlates with age whether people want to or not, or feel comfortable or not with technology. And I don't know if it can be called cultural or not, but this is a problem that, that I come across, and I was hoping we could give <laughs> that instead. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think my first response would be that, you know, culture is not static, it's dynamic, number one. And what makes it dynamic is that every new generation adds its own bit. Uh, the second, so far as the Indian context is concerned, as uh, Ali was saying just now, probably about 60% of our population is below the age of 30, maybe half below the age of 25. And this is also a population which is growing up with one party character, the pessimist. Uh, they are also growing up with a uh, lot less of some aspects of what one could call as <coughs> Indian culture and it was understood earlier. Um, and that makes for a very fascinating dynamic, you know, uh, I don't believe in hyperbolics, but uh, you know, one could claim that uh, India is probably going the most massive demographic and cultural shift, uh, even as we talk you know, here, and the, the results of that shift you could see probably in another 10, 15 years, but we are undergoing that shift, uh, because uh, and you know, as a teacher, I see the shift. I've been back here in the country for 10 years, and I see the shift in the students who went out 10 years ago and the students who are going out today. There is a marked difference in the way they think uh, in those fundamental assumptions of interpersonal behavior, and uh, what drives them compared to the earlier, uh, uh, the earlier batch, uh, batches that went out, and so on. So, and just a Can I take two minutes? You sure. Uh, but Mr. be brief, as she said. Yeah, very brief, uh, Mr. with the permission of the moderators. I want to ask all of you a question. I'll take one minute. Today, the most populous country in the world is China. The second most populous country in the world is India. And the third most populous country in the world, I believe, is America, USA. 330 million. In 30 years from now, 35, maybe 40 years from now, the most populous country in the world will probably still be China, very close. 
The second most populous country in the world will be India, possibly number one, but one or two. And the third most populous country in the world will be Indonesia. Indonesia. Nigeria. That's right. It will be Nigeria. So this thing about demography, my short point is not only India, Vietnam, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nigeria, much more than India. So this is young thing is not about India. Short no, I want to add something to what you said. Uh, having an Indian studied in the U.S. now lives in France with an American wife, and you said, "I wish, I hope this panel can, you know, do something like solving a problem." Uh, my dear friend, your problem is unsolvable. But the the issue is, having worked as an international marketing manager for a few years, travel around some parts of the world, having taught in about five, six different countries and different cultures over the years, I think. Cultural differences are to be celebrated and enjoyed, not be looked at as a problem. And I assure you, at times they can be frustrating. Frustrating, like you are in Nagoya city and you are hungry in the evening at seven o'clock, and you can't make out what the signs on the vertical pieces of cloth say, whether it is a, a whether it is a restaurant or it is somebody's home. So there are frustrations, but. I think at the end of it, if you if you retain or if you develop uh, a kind of, as I was saying, a kind of a globally uh, culturally sensitive mindset, it is great fun, and it also adds to whatever you are doing, either as an academic or as a business person or as a designer or as a you know artist. I think it adds to the the richness of human existence and that is where you don't have a problem to solve my dear friend enjoy yourself while the ride is on <laughs> why he has a choice <laughs> ask him. Or, i don't have to ask him yes sir question yeah So, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Teer Thanka Goyal. Uh, I have long international experience in uh, many co many countries, particularly in France and Germany. And uh, in the past, uh, I presented a new technology in India with a company like Areva, Siemens, and Alstom. Uh, so, so I think uh, I'm I was one of the few Indians. I mean, who is in a great responsibility with a French company? Uh, when you talk about Indians, if I may add, she said, please be brief. <laughs> So how much minutes? I ask you, how much minutes do I have? <laughs> Three. Okay. With the, with what the is answer. This, <laughs> this is a statement, question, comment, observation. Three minutes, sir, if you don't mind, no, because no. there are other people here too. Uh, so, <laughs> so when I arrived in uh, France, uh, it was quite a challenge because everybody asked me uh, whether I'm uh, work in an informatic department or engineer. And I, when I told them I'm in a commercial department, they still they still don't believe it. Uh, so coming back on this uh, culture aspect, when I started working in Areva, I I found a very strange thing. The, my first meeting that still reminds me, there was a guy who was speaking for one and a half hours, and all the guys were listening. Okay, and uh, all the people, I was only the non-French guy, and all people were taking notes, and they wrote four or five pages, and I got nervous in the end because I did not write anything. And uh, I tried to look into the uh, neighbor's uh, diary, what they are writing, and they were doing like this. They were not showing it to me, and in the end, I asked uh, the person, uh, what is the result? Donc, uh, he told me in the French, the pressure on the wool, sir, après deux semaines. Uh, so it kept on continuing, and for me it was very strange. One man speaking for one and a half hour, other 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 listening and taking notes for five pages, six pages, and uh, so one day I decided to ask a question. Uh, okay, if I can ask uh, about this thing because it, it was in an Indian contest, and uh, I thought uh, if I can ask question, and he was giving the direction. My boss, he comes from the Ecole Polytechnique, and. Uh, so I asked him a question and uh, I, I, I told him that he did not perhaps understood what the Indian client is trying to tell us. 
So he did not like the question and he said, come back to my office and uh, we will discuss one to one. Okay, so he, I went to his uh, office and uh, he told me, uh, you are not French in France, you are not supposed to ask a question in a meeting. And uh, I was still surprised, uh, later on it, it took me three years to discover why it's like that. So uh, Mr. Chikdeep Shokar has given me three minutes, so I will not answer on this question, why, it, why it's still like that. Uh, so this was one of the very interesting observation and still it is, uh, it is being continued. Uh, my another observation is uh, about France. Uh, uh, from the Indian's perspective, uh, uh, when the Indian reached there, everything is simple. The, the French language, it's difficult, uh, but one can uh, still uh, learn it. The interesting thing is how to change your mentality. For example, if you go to the, re by nature, most of the Indians are vegetarian. If you go to the French restaurant and say, you know, give me some salad, and the waiter will not understand. Uh, so you tell him you take out that uh, beef or uh, and chicken. So he will be wondering uh, what 20 euro uh, without a piece of meat uh, is going to pay for uh, uh, the salad. So still it is uh, it's very difficult uh, in France. But how to change the mentality? That's a perspective I am trying to give. How to you can learn French, you can understand the mentality. But how will you change your habit? If you are uh, vegetarian, how will you become non-vegetarian? The last thing, and I because I have three minutes, uh, <laughs> the uh, the from French side, uh, the India India is a it is a big uh, black box. They don't uh, they don't understand. I want, actually I wanted to quote about one of my experience in India. If you permit me, maybe I may be ex exceeding four minutes. Uh, when I was you with are exceeding three minutes, okay. you are taking four minutes. Okay, so I stop. Huh? Sorry, thanks. No question? Uh, it was not a question, so. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Could you? It works. Hello, I was just wondering whether you think that there's a lot to learn from multicultural organizations such as the World Bank or the UNESCO. Because when you look at them, you can think that this is the example of the multicultural organization. Um, perhaps you've touched on that before. In that case, I'm sorry. But otherwise, I'd like to know whether, and I think you've partly responded to it with the, by mentioning the book, um, of Mary Douglas, if I'm not wrong, how organizations think. Um, but I was only wondering whether you could shed some light on that. I, I can at least give a personal perspective. I think, you know, be, I, I think some of the points people were making earlier, I, I at least believe you have to differentiate, well, let me rephrase, you have to differentiate between nationality and culture. You know, so this notion of identity, I'm not an anthropologist, but anthropologists will say, people can have multiple identities, right? And so I can be an academic, I can be an Indian, I can be male, so on and so forth. The question is what dominates. So I think we need to be a little bit careful in thinking about where you can draw lessons. I mean, for example, I actually interact fair with people with the World Bank. I actually would not call it multicultural. It's very homogenous culture in a way of thinking. I mean, same way academics may think of themselves as being multicultural, but actually academics very often think in a particular way. Right? So I think, and, and that in a sense is a, is a defining characteristic. So I, I think we need to be a little bit careful when we are thinking about multiculturalism and because I actually certainly believe in the power of multiculturalism. Where is it that you actually can draw on lessons about how to manage diversity or how to leverage diversity? And in some cases where it actually is not really. I mean, I see many organizations that take diversity and turn it into monoculture. And so I think we have just to be a little bit careful on that. I mean, not, this is not a tirade against the World Bank, not at all. I think it's an interesting organization. I'm just saying that I think it's a, a, a kind of a dom it, there is, but there is a kind of a dominant culture there of a particular kind, uh, as I would say in academia and so on and so forth. So. Yeah, can I answer to that? Yeah. Sure. yeah, that's a very good question, and I'm glad Abhut said that. In fact, uh, before I made my initial remarks, I was trying to think, are there really multicultural organizations? And even though we, I said our company operates in more than 25 countries, in fact, uh, 
and now I'm going out on the limb here, but basically each organization, successful organization, likes to think of it as the Birla culture or as the Coca-Cola culture, General Electric, GE culture. In fact, people more yeah. owe allegiance to their organization. Right. You may be in Hong Kong, you may be in Paris, you may be in Bombay, right. but I'm a GE man, they say. Right. And GE people have this quote, you know, Johnson & Johnson. They're, they're, you may be all over the world. So in fact, it's true. Same thing with the World Bank or the, you know, that is actually, it, it, they try to develop an identity or a culture which says this is World Bank culture. It may be rich, it may be, there may be a lot of positive things about it, but in fact, they are not multicultural organizations in that sense. And so I was trying to think very hard about which, what kind of multicultural organizations do we really know. In fact, most successful organizations try to become, they don't call it monoculture, but they try to, they have a distinctive culture of their own, I think. And uh, just to add one more point, you know, since he brought up that delicate question of Jew, uh, you know, uh, Jew, Semitic, and Arabic. Jew is a religion, Judaism is a religion, mm. Semitic is a race, and Arab actually is the culture or language. And you can be all three at the same time, but there's so much conflation of these three things, since you mentioned multiple identities, that people all, always conflate. So you, you cannot imagine somebody who is, uh, let's say, uh, Jewish and Arabic, I mean, of course, you know, since you are all experts, you might know, but in a lot of people's minds, the other three are conflated. This is a good mm. example of how things get conflated. Well, let me, let me, I was trying to stay away from that, but as a student of culture and in organizations, culture operates at multiple levels. The most commonly understood is national or societal culture. If three of us were trying to edit a book and uh, it was out of this long project and we, had, we were trying to say an in-depth study of 25 First, we thought nations. Then we thought there are nations which are multi -culture, multiple cultures within a nation. Then we said states. We were not comfortable with that. Then we said in-depth study of 25 cultures. We were still not comfortable because they were looking, there were some, uh, a commonality was missing and see, we finally landed up at an in-depth study of 25 societies. So cultures most commonly thought about national or societal. But there are very strong organizational cultures which have been mentioned, IBM. As a matter of fact, the first large study in management was a study of 49 countries where IBM operated. And they were all IBM employees. And while the study became very, very celebrated and it is still celebrated, people discovered that that's reflected IBM culture more than their national cultures. So cultures operate societally, nationally, they operate in terms of organizations, they operate in terms of professions. Within academics, business strategy professors wear suits and organizational behavior professors wear jeans. And it shows uh, doctors across the world behave in a particular way. Armed forces people of the army I have seen them behave in India, in France, and in the U.S. They cut across nationalities. The houses, the way pictures are hung in the, on the walls, are similar. So cultures operate at multiple levels, and therefore the, the notion when one is trying to understand cultures in a in slightly deeper way, one has to be clear about what is your unit of analysis. Is it a society? Is it an organization? Is it a profession? Or what? So what you are saying, I mean, these gentlemen have been very kind and polite and circumspect. World Bank is not a multicultural organization. It is American. I am sorry to be so blunt. But that is what World Bank is. And therefore, there is no multiculturalism in the World Bank. Um, I just wanted to make a small comment. Um, I am a technologist, but um, I have studied culture because I did media studies. So I'm just going to take two tropes. One is uh, culture itself. It comes from the word cultivar and hence agriculture. So you know the seeds that you are collecting for the next crop is what is going to decide the next crop is going to be and hence you know it's it has a idea of temporal uh, time and it also has an idea of plasticity which uh, Mr. Sahai was talking about the you know that over a period of time culture changes so there is no 
static concept of culture and uh, it is plastic because you know you could be uh, talking to people of the same geographical area and end up not having a conversation because you don't under, under untranslatability and again i'm going to talk uh, about habit uh, that comes from you know pre swear habit and these two tropes are what interests me uh, in terms of what the conversation uh, is happening and I'm, i wanted it to be thought provoking uh you know what is being discussed well it was not a question but it has certainly provoked me or reminded me of a saying which is quite common in india which might throw some light on agriculture at least uh, there is a state in india called west bengal which is supposed to be bengali language has uh, li rich and old literary tradition uh, and theater and so on are very popular in west bengal and there's a state in the northern part of the country called the punjab which is the granary of the country it grows all the grains and it has a lot of very well developed agriculture so the local saying in india is bengalis have culture and punjabis have agriculture yeah yeah just a, a quick remark when my students are asking, are asking uh, what is culture at the beginning of our course, uh, I used to quote two uh, authors named Klocker and Krugenhold. They wrote uh, an essay in 1962, and they tried to find how many different definitions of culture could be found at that time in sociology, and they found 162 different cultures. As a matter of fact, it's only five. But what they say at the, at the end is that culture, or either as a practice or as a study, is a study of regularities, which means, of course, you have mentalities, you have history, you have uh, values. But the fact is that within a community, there are regular behavior, regular way of asking questions, re regular way of avoiding questions, and the problem is that uh, it's not because you are a member of one community that you are incarnating all the dimension of your culture. This is very important because most of the people are making a, a, a confusion between culture and identity and the idea that all the people within a community are full aware of all the dimension of your own or their own community, which is not true. If you are asking a French, what is a French? Really, you will have very and various differences. Look at the political situation in France. It's a tense uh, discussion. What is a French? Uh, but the problem that you will have a lot of different differences, uh, answers, different answers within the, uh, the national territory. And there is a famous French historian named Fernand Brodel who wrote a wonderful uh, book on the French identity. And his conclusion was that French is a miracle because if you are looking, for instance, on the way people are cooking, in the north they are using oil, in the, um, sorry, uh, Saint-Dou, I don't know, Greece, in the east, uh, uh, butter, oh, no, it's the contrary, in the north, butter, in the east, Greece, and in the south, Wales. They are not marrying in the same uh, way. They are not using the crops in the same way. But they are French on the political point of view, but on a cultural point of view. It's a huge variety. Okay? It is very important because, of course, it's moving, but it's moving very slowly. Just to give you an example and to be provocative. If you are looking on the sexual behavior of young people in France, you can see from an old point of view, they are more open-minded, free. But if you are looking on the actual facts, things are moving very, very, very slowly. The first, the first marriage, the first baby, in 20 or 30 times, let's say perhaps one year earlier than their parents or grandparents. So you see there are regularities, and the most difficult thing is to go in depth and to be able to find from where it comes, who influence. And I, I was, uh, and it's not a political 
frontier who is designing the inner culture and the outsider culture. It's more complex than this. Uh, we are about to wind up. Would any of the panelists have some concluding comments? That's your job. No, I will. <laughs> Any, uh, anybody else? <laughs> well, in addition to thanking all of you for being a very, very wonderful audience, I just remembered when Eric was saying this thing about inner and outer, I think the essence of multiculturalism lies in, in three words, since you mentioned words, which came out in a class discussion I was having somewhere uh, on, on this topic of, on a course on managing across cultures. And those three words are expect differences. First, expect differences. Number two, accept differences. And lastly, if one can do that, respect differences. If anybody can do that, I think that person has reached that cerebral level of globalized multicultural sensitivity. So the first stage is expecting that people will be different, business practices will be different, the way they use. This was an interesting example to me. Eric was trying to tell us how they cook in north, east, west, and south of France, but he got, cost, he got lost in grease, oil, whatever else. Butter. Butter. So, I mean, a French person is, does not really remember fully exactly what is happening where, which is very nice. No, it's because of my English, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> well, when you speak in French, I don't understand, so that's all right. So, expecting differences accepting differences and respecting difference is the key and if we can remember that celebrate I think celebrate. well celebrating differences is also worth it well thanks to Ajit expect accept respect and celebrate you know celebrate doesn't rhyme with those three <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much and thank you thank you very much I'd like to call this uh, session to an order. This is a round table on engineers to managers, executive management. I have a very eminent panel here along with my co-chair, uh, Sebastian. Um, I am, I what I, we would like to do is to ask every speaker here to give the opening statements uh, for about seven to eight minutes. And then we will throw open the floor for speakers. And anyone of you who would like to make a presentation or who would like to speak, uh, uh, we already have got one speaker, so we will request him to speak for about six, seven minutes. And then we will also entertain uh, discussion. And discussion should form the core part of it. Uh, before uh, we start our, our presentations, I just want to give the background in terms of why such a session is at all required today uh, because of the fact that there are many uh, inadequacies or if I may call it as the shortcomings of the higher education today. The higher education has exploded in terms of number. The engineering education has exploded in terms of variety of subjects and more knowledge, but the quality becomes a very major issue. And there are several, several feedbacks from employers indicating that in India, the number of employable graduates has come down to even 25 percent. And agencies like NASCOM and many other agencies have also indicated that the 
higher education needs a different component of uh, element. I mean, just saying that you will teach physics, chemistry, maths, solid mechanics and fluid mechanics may not be sufficient. There is a need for transforming education in general. Management is a very important aspect of it. Uh, as they say, there is a pentium inside. So there has to be some basic changes in the curriculum which require the students to understand that besides the domain knowledge, there are other aspects. As a matter of fact, what I would like to mention is that people from industry will explain what are the expectations People from academia will indicate what experiments they have done. And this transformation of engineering education is very crucial and we would like to take that as our broader context in this discussion. Uh, this is not uh, IAM or Indian Institute of Management promotion exercise in some sense. Uh, I just want to mention to you that uh, uh, there are three things that we try to do in education. There is a mind and we want to train the thinking of the students. So critical thinking and therefore the ability to understand the complex concepts, to understand and appreciate very difficult principles, ultimately is the development of the mind. Then there has been liberal arts for many, many centuries actually, where the students are taught philosophy, the students are taught languages, students are taught uh, economics or sociology or psychology and several other subjects. I consider that to be a training for developing a good heart. So you have the mind, you have the heart and the third thing is you have the hands. Mm -hmm. And the skills of the people have to be developed in the education process wherein you say that this is the mind, heart and the hands. In fact, uh, Somebody asked uh, that if you have to solve a differential equation or fix a bulb, an IIT student can solve a differential equation but can't fix a bulb, you know. So because the hands training is very inadequate. So typically what is required is to bring a balance of education where you develop the mind, you develop the heart, and you develop the hands of a young person. If you can do that through your education process, then obviously you have done a good job of your education. Unfortunately, at least in India, because of the fact that the quantity has exploded, the quality has come down, employability, because of the fact that this is not an overall development, is an issue. In terms of management, several companies have indicated to us that we really want the graduates to become on a fast track. The responsibilities come nowadays so fast. Uh, what are the things that are required within the young people which are never done in the academic environment? And the most critical is the time management. Never taught in any of the academic institutions, to the best of my knowledge in India. Uh, the time management becomes very critical when the students go to the companies and start their professional life. Uh, there are a lot of companies now in India as well as abroad where they have to deal with a boss who is overseas and they have never seen the boss. But at 5 o'clock there is a call because if it is US, 7, 8 o'clock in the morning, it's 6 o'clock in India and therefore many students who after graduation join a company and they say, no, I have a meeting at 6 o'clock and that's the call. And for years they don't ever see the boss. And the accent of the boss is different. You haven't seen the boss, but the deadlines are real. So obviously the question of having an international boss is a part of the management uh, culture, which is very difficult to understand. Uh, some of the companies have told us in academia very clearly that within a couple of years, the student may become a manager. Is he good? Is he mature enough at the time of graduation that I can promote him to be a manager within two to three years? So obviously the time constants of becoming a manager. In the good old days when you will join a very traditional British company like Metalbox or 
uh, Hindustan Motors, it will take at least 15 years for you to become a manager. Now when you join some company today, you will find that within two to three years, you take on the responsibility of management. And uh, is there enough that we have done in the academic world wherein such a transformation of young persons can happen in some form? Uh, stress is a very important aspect of life, both professional and personal. Um, I had, unfortunately, to deal with several cases of suicides. As you know, Bangalore is considered as the Indian capital of suicides, and most of them coming from the IT profession. So obviously, why is this so? The management has to look at in terms of the stress of life that is happening in the professional world, and therefore management of stressed out people is very important, actually. Um, burnout factor, there are a lot of people who work day in and day out, and uh, sometimes they get a burnout feeling that after six or seven years, you get just disenchanted with everything, actually. So this is also another phenomena of the management, which one has to look at it. And finally, the most important part is relationships. The relationships is a very critical element of management, which again, as a part of education, is missing in terms of how to handle it. So when you look at the three elements of mind, heart, and hands, the three elements of the mind is a na the natural sciences, hand is engineering and technology, and the heart is related to social sciences, humanities, um, management education, and several other things like performing arts and lateral education as we call it. So if you have lateral education, if you have engineering and technology education, and if you have a balance of natural sciences, you do three things, critical mind, good heart, and good hands. Unfortunately, the good hands is not a very strong point at least in the Indian higher education. So obviously internship, working in industry or doing some projects which are meaningful, all these aspects of education are very important. We may not spend more time on that, but today at least as to how to look at the role of social sciences, humanities, liberal arts, philosophy, uh, the different other aspects of management, I think that is the issue that we would like the, uh, the speakers and the audience to deliberate upon as to how to bring that transformation. Clearly looking at this uh, whole analysis, uh, the Mahindra group uh, decided to set up a completely new engineering institution in Hyderabad. And uh, we have a curriculum which will be a five-year curriculum, unlike the four-year curriculum, a dual degree program with a specialization in energy or environment or materials or uh, design or manufacturing, and the bachelor's program, which will be like civil engineering or mechanical engineering, with a very strong core uh, component. Industrial internship is very important. Unfortunately, that also has been not very successfully done. Many students used to come to me, and after the industrial training, they came to me and they said, now I know exactly why I should never join any industry, you know, because having seen two months of <laughs> absolute nonsense, they said, no more industry. That should not happen. I mean, that's a very wrong training that we have done under the garb of industrial training, actually. So how to develop the hands, how to develop the habits, Ultimately, it is the habits that matter a lot. And again, the question of developing habits is a part of the management education or the management culture. Unless you have good habits, you can't expect any of these other efficient practices. So I think the, the, the topic that has been given to us is engineers to managers, executive management. Obviously, there are some things which we have not discussed, maybe if time permitting. We can talk it something called as the leadership or executive development programs. Mid-career development programs are very important. At IIT Kanpur, we have now a program called Visionary Leaders for Manufacturing. It's a very unique program jointly done by IIT Kanpur, IIM Calcutta, 
and IIT Madras and people who have got six, seven years of experience, they come and work, they are in the program for one year and after that they go to Japan, get training, they do internship, they do uh, project and after one year they are again ready to go for a very high level executive position. So you have two trajectories. The first trajectory is zero to seven years and the next one is seven to twenty years. So both these journeys are very important and therefore I find that this particular aspect of how we can transform a human being with excellent mind, with capable hands and also a good heart. I think that's my take on the program and the discussions today. I would now request Sebastian to give his comments and then we will proceed. Thank, okay, thank you Mr. Chairman. So I would, I would like to say first that uh, I'm, and it's, uh, it's an honor for me to share this uh, session with you, Professor Dande. And um, also, I would like to thank you for hijacking my speech. Oh! oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, but but we've, I've, I've, as it will be explained maybe during the discussion, we, we are working a lot together right now. So he knows what I think and I know what he thinks and we are on the same... Uh, um, we have good connections concerning all those subjects, so I, I, I won't spend too much, too much time on this. I will just uh, present myself, maybe. I'm um, a French um, a researcher from CNRS, the French National Research Institute, and I'm also the deputy director of a laboratory uh, in, in the field of transport and energy based in Ecole Centrale Paris. And uh, Ecole Centrale Paris has... Uh, has been in the, in the Indian news uh, recently due to the fact that we are working with Mahindra uh, to help them in, in install this new uh, institute in Hyderabad. So uh, this is something also we can discuss during the, during the session. So I won't, I won't spend too much time now. I'd, I'd like to, to keep time for the questions and maybe we can uh, start um, uh, the, 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 um, the presentations from uh, the speakers. Professor, Professor Dande, did you have anything in mind concerning the, the, um, the, the, the way we should do this? Indian first, French first, one of each? No, from, from, <laughs> Let's the, start from the left. From the left to the right. Yeah, so yeah. very... Much <laughs> simpler. Yeah, very easy. Yeah.